We're going to start the clinical sciences plenary session. And it's with great pleasure that I would like to introduce Dr. Jurgen Rockstro. And I could stand up here and speak for many minutes about his many accomplishments. But at his request, I'll keep it fairly brief. Dr. Rockstro is a professor of medicine and head of the HIV outpatient clinic at the University of Bonn in Germany. In addition to clinical practice, he has conducted extensive research on antiretroviral therapy, the course of HIV disease in those with hemophilia, and in HIV hep C co-infection. This morning, he will be talking about hepatitis C and HIV co-infection on its way to microelimination. What challenges remain? Dr. Rockstro. Good morning, bonjour. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first time, a long trip, and I saw many Canadian airports on the way here, but it's really nice <laughs> to finally see Saskatoon. So uh, as alluded to, my talk will be around uh, hepatitis C and HIV co-infection and the issues around micro, uh, microelimination. Let me start with the general picture with regard to epidemiology. I know you're all very well aware that there is overlapping transmission pathways, so not so surprisingly, we see 2.3 million co-infected with hepatitis C on top of their HIV infection, which is a rather conservative estimate, obviously very strongly relates to the percentage of IV drug users in your population, so not so surprising in most of the IV drug user uh, populations, you could find that 80% harbor hepatitis C antibodies as a big sign of how important this co-infection is in that particular group. You can see that men who have sex with men have an increasing rate of hepatitis C infection as well, whereas we still see very few uh, cases within pure uh, heterosexually transmitted HIV infection. Now, the special thing about MSM is that quite some years ago, in 2002, there was a first report on an outbreak of acute hepatitis C among MSM who were HIV positive from the main hospitals in London, Chelsea, Westminster. And really what happened subsequently from 2002 and onwards, if you go into literature or PubMed, and I always have a fellow who sort of has to go through the difficult task of seeing what all has been published. So this is a, a world map which summarizes all published cases of acute hepatitis C. So this is not a true reflection of all cases, there are much more, because not every case obviously becomes a part of a study or is published. But you can see that what has started with some cases in London has really become a global epidemic. Uh, and you can see that it affects various continents, Australia, North America, and particular Europe, but now more recently also Asia. And one of the fascinating things is always remembering that when HIV became prominent, we had hardly any hepatitis C cases in the MSM population that is happening in different places at different uh, populations at the same time point. And in the Asian outbreak, you will see there are interestingly also a lot of genotype 2 infections, something we have not seen. I know that in Canada you also have an outbreak of acute hepatitis C among the MSM, but also with different genotypes. The genotype 1 and 4 is the dominant European genotype. So really asking a little bit the question, why are we seeing that suddenly in MSM at different places of the world and what has really changed? The risk of hepatitis C in HIV infected MSM is strongly enhanced. The only population where it's even higher is in prison settings. But remember that in prison settings, these things are controllable. All of that depends on what kind of interventions are available. Um, and obviously, in the setting of sexual transmission, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, it's probably different because sexual behavior to change is very complicated. To pass out free syringes is at least something which is possible. It may not be feasible uh, in legal systems. This also includes the German system, where some prisons do distribute clean uh, syringes, but most don't, and so obviously that comes with issues around transmission. So when this sort of happened, the big question was why is that really happening and what is contributing? There was <clears throat> clearly an increase in other sexually transmitted diseases, so there was the question, is concomitant syphilis or lymphogranuloma venerum contributing to risk of transmission? 
It was obviously related to high-risk sexual practices. So if you look at hemophilia cohorts like the one I'm in charge of, so in Bonn where I work, in 1984 there were 800 hemophiliacs, half of them had HIV, and 95% had hepatitis C. In these hemophiliacs who, except one, all have heterosexual relationships, um, <clears throat> at least according to the documentation, there was only one case of heterosexual transmission over 20 years of follow-up. Uh, so the risk within the context of sexual transmission of hepatitis C in heterosexual setting is very, very low, whereas in the MSM population it's much higher and it seems to be related to traumatic sex practices. So it's not necessarily sexual per se, so it's a question of what kind of sex you're doing and how high does the risk become of having a blood semen or blood blood contact. And that will relate to the number of partners you have in a given sex party event, for example. And it uh, is also some interesting work from Daniel Fear's group, which has found or described that hepatitis C is shed into the rectum of co-infected men, which may increase transmission. It's directly related to the viremia a patient has. So there may also be differences in the level of infectiousness depending on baseline viremia. There's Dutch work from Amsterdam showing that dendritic cells and Langerhans cells are able to capture hepatitis C, so these are more, uh, also macrophages, and are efficient in transmitting the virus to other cells, which may also be part of this transmission puzzle. And clearly, the early work showed that phylogenetically, these infections were linked, underlining that this was spread via sexual networks. What in the whole context of acute hepatitis C and MSM is sometimes missed is that nevertheless, IV drug users remain the most vulnerable population for hepatitis C. And I think it's important in all the ongoing research around MSM and sexual transmission not to forget that the highest number of patients to the very day is found obviously in the setting of IV drug use. And the recent opioid crisis, be it in uh, U.S. or in your own country, I think pictures this very well. Obviously with the change in use patterns, so if you start injecting drugs with a very short half-life which requires four to five or six injections per day, you can imagine that this will further increase and fuel the epidemic and places who had very low hepatitis C rates can suddenly change when networks occur where this uh, uh, occurs. The natural history of hepatitis C played a big role in the early days of HIV, because most of the cohort work, and this is just one example from the largest European cohort, Eurocida, where you see 18,000 HIV-infected individuals. In this particular cohort, 30% have hepatitis C, so that's somewhat higher than the overall prevalence I showed you on a global level. It has a lot to do with that in the initial days of HIV spread in Europe, the southern European countries, in particular Spain and Italy, had high hepatitis C co-infection rates of probably around 50%. And then don't forget that IV drug use is the main driver of HIV in Eastern Europe, where most of the new HIV infections occur. So in particular in Russia and Ukraine, you have very high numbers of hepatitis C co-infection as well. And these populations are also partially included in the UCDA trial. Now of those patients who have replication as a sign of chronic hepatitis C, that's around a quarter of the Eurocida patients, you can see that even in the presence of only antibodies, but even enhanced, if you are additionally replicating, you have a dramatically enhanced risk of dying from liver disease. So liver mortality increases substantially, and previous work has shown that in the setting of developing immune deficiency, you have a much faster fibrosis acceleration. So as such, the guidelines in the early days prior to treating everyone have always recommended a prioritization of HIV treatment in patients with hepatitis C in order to prevent immune deficiency, prevent faster fibrosis prevention, and prevent the over nine times higher risk of dying from liver disease in this particular patient population. Now, if immune deficiency is the main driver of fibrosis progression, the next obvious question obviously can only be, can we reverse some of the impact of HIV immune deficiency by giving HIV treatment? And the Veterans Court has published a nice paper looking at or comparing HIV HCV co-infected versus hepatitis C mono-infected patients and really showing that even in the setting of giving HIV treatment, 
there's still a high risk of hepatic decompensation in patients who are on HIV treatment and co-infected. So you cannot reverse the natural course of hepatitis C to that of mono infection. I think it's fair to say, though, that in this analysis, and you see that on the right-hand side, that the highest risk of progression in the HIV-HC patient population existed for those with a low CD4 count below 200, which have the over 200% excess risk for hepatic decompensation. I think just, again, re-emphasizing that immune deficiency is the main driver, and you could argue that potentially in more modern or recent course, this may actually be different because we do not start at a CD4 count below 200 unless we have a high proportion of late presenters. So potentially, I think, if you start HIV treatment really early, you may actually be able to midgetate the unfavorable course of hepatitis C and prevent faster fibrosis progression. Now, obviously, hepatitis C has an exciting story around treatment development, and as a consequence of that, with direct-acting antivirals being introduced, allowing oral treatment of hepatitis C, no longer using interferon and mostly also not using ribavirin, um, has obviously led to implementation of a change in guidelines, of, um, whereas it was much more complicated in the old days, nowadays, all guidelines, be that ASLD, WHO, or EASL, all recommend that any person with hepatitis C should receive hepatitis C treatment under consideration that cure rates are above 95%, the tolerability is great, and this can be done in 8 to 12 weeks. So hepatitis C therapy has become really quite easy, and that is obviously one of the most sensational breakthroughs in medicine. And I have to say, as a treating physician, it really comes with quite some emotions because when I started my clinical practice in 1989, I was among the first ones to describe that patients were dying from liver disease in the setting of untreated HIV infection. A large number of my hemophiliacs died from liver failure and complications of advanced liver disease. And to suddenly be able to cure every single individual has been a major breakthrough. And that's mostly because patients cannot separate advances of medicine to what you're doing. So they think you are the one who's bringing this super therapy to them, which is really unfortunately not the case. You're just benefiting from advances in medicine. But doing that and having everyone cured, I've got every patient I have sort of who was on the transplantation list treated. No one is needing a liver at this time point. It's just a huge difference and has brought such an element of gratefulness, um, which makes the day in departments, which are sometimes challenging from an administrative point, uh, at least happy to work in from a patient uh, feedback perspective. And I didn't say anything negative about my boss yet, so that's good. All right, so <clears throat> in the EX guidelines, as you would expect, again, every person with hepatitis C on top of his HIV infection should be considered for DA-based therapy, regardless of fibrosis stage. Uh, I think this is a given in most countries, but remember that in lack of resources, this has been an ongoing issue. There's still remaining European countries where there is an allocation according to fibrosis stage. For example, in Romania, uh, for a long time, it was just F3, F4. But obviously, as we begin to understand that the benefits of hepatitis C cure play out even in earlier fibrosis stages, and as prices are being more successfully negotiated and availability of generics is coming uh, broader attention and access, uh, we see how this is disappearing in pretty much every country. Now, in the old days, you may remember that interferon and ribavirin therapy had a worse outcome when you treated HIV, HCV co-infected patients. Only around a third of patients cured their infection, 50% if they had genotype 1 in the setting of mono infection. And with the advent of therapy achieving over 95% cure rates, this was then transferable to HIV patients with hepatitis C, and so there's no longer a separation between indication or the drugs you can use. And that, I think, is a great breakthrough because it also means that companies could loosen up and include HIV, HC co-infected patients into their ongoing trials, which I think has also been a great success because in many indications, in many comorbidities, HIV patients frequently have been uh, excluded because of the fear of drug interactions and other reasons, and so I think this is also a great step uh, forward. At this time point, there's still a recommendation for genotype 
uh, and probably also fibrosis stage, just to make sure that you do check for uh, advanced liver disease because that does require upper endoscopy, HCC screening, and so forth. Um, the EX guidelines shows in this rather busy table the overall combinations you have, and you can see that obviously there are many different regimens, and you know that the EX guidelines tend to include as many possibilities as available because the registrational situation in the European countries may be very different, so it's reflective of countries which may not have certain regimens available, so we still allow to include all kind of different regimens. I would say, though, that in most countries, including the German situation, most people have moved to pure treatment of their patients with pangenotypic regimens, so it's either SOF and VEL, or sofosbuvir or vapatosvir, or the AVI two-drug regimen, gocapavir, preprensisvir, because these are pangenotypic, work for all genotypes, um, and that has become sort of the recommended regimens. But there's also a cost factor which needs to be taken into account on a country-by-country -country level, um, so that's something to keep in mind. The only thing you have to remember is when you treat someone with hepatitis C in the context of HIV is that he is, is or will be on a antiretroviral therapy and as such may be prone for drug interactions. Remember that drugs which are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system in particular will interact and since hepatitis C protease inhibitors just like HIV protease inhibitors are metabolized through that pathway, you can expect interactions or even contraindications for using these drugs together. But remember that there are also much more complex interactions on drug transporter level. And so I think everyone should go through the table and put in the drug interactions. In the world of hepatology, hepatologists sometimes struggle with these, putting the interactions in. But I always say we're very happy to do that. We work at a university. We have a free fixed salary, so we have the time to do that. Uh, so patients can call us up in case no one else wants to look into these tables. But it is important because you can see here some of the major drug interactions. And for example, if you are in an African context, um, where efavirenz, at least until more recently, was the main recommended drug, you can see that that, for example, would not work with soft velpatosphere because there are interactions with velpatosphere. Uh, and efavirenz, there's a substantial decrease in velpatosphere exposure, which may uh, challenge the SVR rate and, and as such. Uh, I think reminds us all how important it is to check for drug interactions. Obviously, in the era of unboosted integrase inhibitors with a very beneficial interaction profile, you mostly can compose regimens which work together, but you may find, at least in rare occasions, it difficult, in particular when you have hemophiliacs who start with AZT monotherapy or now in sort of third-line therapies and are dependent on their protease inhibitor, there may be some interactions you need to consider so it's important to keep that in mind and check accordingly. The story of hepatitis C therapy for some people has become rather boring because they say, well, if I look at all the different anti um, uh, hepatitis C DAA treatment trials, and you see four listed here, regardless of which regimen you look at, in the end, after 12 weeks of therapy, you see the response rates or cure rates are all above 95%, so it really doesn't seem to be any remaining challenge. And if you look at some of the more recent data here at the soft valve a study, you can see again over 93%, and this includes patients who are treatment naive versus treatment experienced, so they failed of prior interferon therapy. Whether you had baseline cirrhosis, yes or no, everything seems to work. And I think as clinicians, that has made our life a lot easier. We can promise good success rates. And obviously, without using interferon, everyone sort of applies for this therapy. We have hardly any contraindications into therapy. There's some very few drug interactions you need to consider, but otherwise, it's really not a challenge at all. And most importantly for the patients, the tolerability has been fantastic. If you just concentrate on the last uh, line in this table, you can see that the discontinuation rate due to adverse events is between 0 and 2 percent. So it's really such a low number of individuals really reflecting how well these treatments are tolerated and I think reassuring us that this is a therapy we can easily administer in our patient population. Now if that is true and if hepatitis C therapy is no longer a challenge, the obvious question is, well, why can't we then treat everyone, cure everyone, 
and eliminate hepatitis C altogether. And that has been the remaining big topic of interest. Uh, there is a separation, if you want to define eradication and elimination. So eradication would require permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidence of infection. Intervention measures would no longer be needed. That seems very unrealistic because we have to then prevent reinfections and new infections, which would require that we have sufficient distribution of needles, syringes, and support and methadone substitution. You know that, for example, in Russia, there is no Russian uh, methadone substitution program, and as long as that president remains, there will never be one, and as such, that will preclude any kind of eradication strategy. For elimination, I think reduction to zero in a defined geographical area, continued intervention is required, but at least it's possible, like in polio, and that's clearly something which at least can be already be demonstrated in various patient groups. Now, WHO, not too long ago, define global targets, which have been very helpful because many countries need these kind of global targets to convince their health ministry to act and try to accomplish these um, goals. So what they want to achieve by 2030, which is 11 years away, is they want to have a 90% reduction in new cases of chronic hepatitis B and C. They want to have 80% of treatment eligible people with chronic hepatitis B and C treated, which is obviously very ambitious. And as a consequence of treating all these people, preferably early enough before they have cirrhosis, you will see a 65% reduction in hepatitis B and C, and many countries have signed up to this program. The question is, is this going to happen? And if you are an HIV treater, you will know that we have been talking very similarly about the 90-90-90 perspective, and we got a little emotional about is there a fourth 90, yes or no, but in the end of the day, Many countries and many cities, in particular London, have now announced that they've achieved 95, 95, 95, so they're overperformers, even in the setting of Brexit, which is something uh, some governments have to chew up to. But if you look at the achievements with regard to global elimination strategy with regard to hepatitis, it is really a moment of frustration because you can see that other than hepatitis B vaccination, which is achieved at around 90%, but if you look at birth date, vaccine administration, that already falls off considerably, which leads to increased rates still of perinatal hepatitis B transmission. You can see how dismal the figures look for hepatitis C treatment. So with the current rates, this is never going to happen, and clearly a combined effort is necessary to make more achievements here. Now in the setting of a country like Germany, where everything is possible, everyone can migrate, we can pay all the countries around us, it's a rich country, at least until recently, before the car business turned out to have little issues. Um, and so in, in a given clinic like mine, if you look at reasons for untreated hepatitis C, you see that out of a group of around 400, there are two who have just been infected with acute hepatitis C, and you're sort of wondering, are they going to clear by themselves? Three are waiting for new options uh, for DIA failure. That was at least when the doctoral student did this analysis. They, uh, by now have all been treated and be cured. Um, some have been just undergoing hip replacement or other medical procedures that were not available for hepatitis C therapy. And then you have the largest group, which is lost to follow-up or non-compliance, who are enjoying shooting up somewhere uh, way afar from the clinic and don't bother to show up for their clinic appointments. So other than those who don't want to be treated, you really have no one left. But obviously, one other way to look at this is, in Germany, you have 250,000 estimated hepatitis C cases, and only 100,000 have been treated, and the number of new treatments is falling dramatically because there have to be testing programs. So there's one thing to say you can treat everyone, but if you don't look actively for them, you're not going to get them. So that's the issue, obviously, of rich countries who are sort of saying we, everyone access everything is possible, but if you do not invest in a diagnostic program, you're obviously not going to find them. But you can see from the slide that, at least in my clinic, hepatitis C, outside of the context of acute hepatitis C, plays hardly any role at all unless new patients are diagnosed and referred for treatment. And what I wanted to show you is what does that all mean in the efforts to eliminate hepatitis C in HIV patients? I think we would all agree that because HIV patients, once they're diagnosed, and remember, our 90-90-90 goal sort of suggests 
that most countries have achieved the first 90. Even in Russia, 80% of patients with HIV are identified. It's really not so much the identification, it's keeping them in care or getting them on treatment. But if that is true, we know which patients have hepatitis C in the setting of HIV. That means we can treat them, and the Spanish have a really fantastic court system, and they looked at the prevalence of hepatitis C in their HIV-infected individuals between 2002 and 2017, and you can see that as referred to earlier during my talk, in the beginning of HIV in Spain, the rate of hepatitis C antibodies was really high. Almost 60% had hepatitis C antibodies as the court is aging, new groups are infected, migration from former colonies, increasingly infected MSM. You can see how that's changing. The number of hepatitis C antibody pa uh, positive patients is declining, but you can also see that with the dramatic increase in treatment on the right-hand side, the number of those who are still replicating has dropped from around 50% to less than 10%. So they have a huge impact through treatment on their overall reservoir, and you can imagine that that potentially will also have an impact on a new in, uh, infections. If you look at the treatment interventions among different risk groups, you can see, first of all, that in the light turquoise blue, there is a little increase in infections in MSM, telling you that the antibody prevalence is increasing as the epidemic has started later and is continuing to take place in that particular population. You can see that risk with IV drug use remains completely unchanged. It's still over 80% throughout all the different time points. But when you look at the RNA positive, you can see that MSM are very likely to be treated. They get identified early on, are referred to treatment. And you can see that also among the IV drug user community, a lot of people have been successfully treated, uh, but still there is some left, which tells you that there are challenges, uh, be it through prejudices that these people are more difficult to treat or in the lack of support systems and programs to make sure that they adhere to the therapy and come to their visits. Now, the MSM patient population, because they're particularly adherent and come for regular CD4 count and RNA control, you can easily find those if you follow the EX guidelines and do your six monthly or annual hepatitis C screen. And as such, it becomes very attractive to think of could you potentially get rid of hepatitis C in this group altogether. Now, one of the important things to remember is that the natural course of hepatitis C is also altered with regard to your probability or likelihood of developing chronic hepatitis C. So when you get infected with hepatitis C, you have probably a 30% chance of clearing the infection by itself. And remember, it's different than HIV or HPV. It's not integrated. So if you're really getting rid of your hepatitis C RNA, then that is a cured infection or a cleared infection. But in the setting of HIV, this is really occurring in a much lower percentage, it's only around 10 to 15 percent. So very few patients with HIV are able to clear their infection. Uh, most of them go on to take a chronic course. Uh, in the European cohort, which gathers all these acute hepatitis C cases, which is funded by the NEAT ID Foundation, which is called Probe C, very nice work demonstrated that if you diagnose a new hepatitis C and you repeat your RNA measurement four weeks later, if there's not a two-log drop, this patient will not be able to clear his infection. So you could sort of move the time point of treatment intervention much earlier and treat four weeks after diagnosis, which makes perfect sense if you also want to prevent transmission of hepatitis C in this high-risk patient population group. And so this has been the basis of our marker for recommending hepatitis C therapy in the context of acute hepatitis C. This is the EX acute hepatitis C treatment algorithm, which really says you repeat your hepatitis C RNA after confirmed infection. Four weeks later, if you do not have the two-log drop, you recommend treatment. If there is a two-log drop, then that patient may clear infection and you have close monitoring uh, thereafter. So it's really an attempt to define an earlier treatment intervention, which is important because according to the label in most European countries, drugs are only licensed for treatment of chronic hepatitis C. If you sort of classify chronic hepatitis C as six months of persistent replication, then you have missed a long time period in which further people have become infected. And as such, the European AIDS Society is fighting for an earlier time point of intervention and a redefinition of what is acute and chronic and calling it early and chronic infection.
Um, and one thing we're struggling with from the European Aid Society is that our friends from the hepatology societies are much more conservative, which has a lot to do with the fact that they're not seeing these patients and as such do not, I think, equally value or appreciate the risk of early onward transmission of hepatitis C in this particular group. So EASL is a little bit more progressive, but they say there's no ideal time point for starting therapy as that has not been firmly established, so sort of leave it sort of in between. That's difficult because health insurances will only reimburse if you have strong wording in your text, so leaving it vague is not necessarily helpful. And ASLD says um, uh, that uh, if a decision is to made, they say that wait at least 12 to 14 weeks before starting treatment to allow time for possible spontaneous clearance. And, and I think that is just in contrast to our data. Now, Americans sometimes have difficulties reflecting on European data, and I think that finds its way here in the ASLD recommendations for HIV patients, um, because I think it would be very helpful to have that earlier time discussion. There will be a new consensus conference uh, on acute hepatitis C management, which includes all these different entities, um, which is, takes place in June. Uh, in Amsterdam, and hopefully we come up with a very strong recommendation which will allow a revision of the guidelines uniformly through all medical societies and help to convince payers that it's uh, worthwhile to intervene early. As a consequence of the toxicity of interferon and the unclear legal or regulatory situation for administering DA therapy early after diagnosis of hepatitis C, you can see here in a recent poster from Croy uh, at the annual rates of treatment initiation, which have gone down substantially over time, as people obviously do not want to be treated with interferon anymore, which was the only licensed combination for uh, acute hepatitis C intervention. Uh, and, and that is obviously reflective of delaying therapy many because of the fear of reimbursement issues for therapy, and as a consequence, probably fueling the epidemic in a certain way. There has been an attempt to look at cost effectiveness, and this was done in cooperation with particularly Dutch researchers who took the whole Dutch acute hepatitis C data from the acute hepatitis C outbreak there and modeled it, and were able to demonstrate that there were substantial cost savings when you treated early on after diagnosis rather than waiting later. Uh, so, so I think that's also something to reflect, and we hope that the cost effectiveness analysis will be a strong argument in our uh, attempt to convince payers to uh, fund this intervention. There has been some discussion around the high reinfection rates in MSM with HIV and hepatitis C infection, and the question is, would pure increase in the rate of people we treat and earlier treatment duration help? Um, and this is a modeling paper from Natasha Martin, who's done a lot of wonderful work in this area, with uh, Patrick Ingelis from the Berlin cohort. And really showing that if there's no scale up, we're going to see a further increase in new infections. If we would treat all newly diagnosed patients after six months, um, we're going to see a slight decrease in new infections. But if we would treat earlier and also have risk reduction interventions, then that would probably be the most successful strategy. So there is a call in general for behavioral interventions. The only question I think I have is what is that going to be and how are we going to successfully implement that? And I think there are more question marks than answers at this time. The remaining challenges are obviously the cost of therapy. Let me just say, though, that various European countries have shown us how cost discussions can be led. The price in Portugal is far lower than in Germany. The price in Italy is far lower, and they have introduced successful models where basically they said, we're willing to treat very, very many patients, but the price goes down the more they treat, so they sort of have a different allocation, whereas in Germany, the tendency is rather to pay high prices and not really worry about it. Reinfection rate, I think, is one of the big challenges, and often people say, well, how are we going to deal with someone who has fifth, sixth infection, and there's a discussion, is that worthwhile? And I think that's something which causes uh, quite some controversial arguments. Uh, you can see that the co-infection patients have the highest rate of reinfection, 21%. Uh, there's still a high risk of reinfection IV drug users, but again, that is all preventable through administration of clean needles and syringes and methadone substitution or opioid substitution uh, programs. Uh, but to change sexual behavior appears to be far more difficult. This is the large um, 
probe C cohort analysis showing that up to year two, 25% of individuals with the first episode of acute hepatitis C had an episode of reinfection. Of those who had a second acute hepatitis C, almost 50% had a third one, telling you that obviously behavioral interventions here are very, very uh, unlikely to lead to success and, and clearly prompting that reinfection is an issue. Now, one of the issues which additionally came across is that there is a high prevalence now also of hepatitis C among HIV negative men who have sex with men, and this becomes more apparent as various countries are building up PrEP cohorts. You see work here from the Amsterdam PrEP court, which found that 4.8% of their individuals seeking uh, PrEP actually had a hepatitis C infection, so really telling you that by far this epidemic has now reached also HIV negative MSM, uh, and, and clearly that was phylogenetically very well related to the infections in the HIV positive individuals. Same has been described for England, 8% uh, have acute hepatitis C within the PrEP uh, cohort, uh, and various reports from France, and again one from Amsterdam, show high rates of hepatitis C in mono infection. Now, one of the most reassuring papers uh, in the past have really been the ones looking of how can we, if we treat acute hepatitis C, does that have an impact on new cases? And the Dutch were the first to show that after unrestricted access to DAAs, three-quarters of their patients have been treated. If you look um, uh, of the outcome, 83% of their MSM have been cured, and that has subsequently transcended into a reduction in new cases of 50%. So they showed for the first time 50% less new infections. The Swiss, in a Swiss way, very structured, very organized, screened all their patients, identified everyone in the Swiss court who was still having hepatitis C, showed that you can have ongoing replication, although you have no hepatitis C antibodies, highlighting that you can, or ha may, might have to screen with RNA, not only with antibodies in some patients, and then offered treatment to all, and again showed a 50% decrease in new incident infections and a 92% decrease in chronic infections. So microelimination appears feasible, and early treatment can lead to a rapid reduction of new cases. And so I think it becomes apparent that this will be cost effective. And clearly, we have to make sure that this is something which happens, regardless whether you're looking at MSM or IV drug users, uh, to make sure that we can prevent new infections. The last study which showed similar data comes from London. This is from Sanjay Bagani's effort to get uh, patients from three large London hospitals together. And again, you see a 68% reduction in all, in, fact, in all new first infections, uh, sorry, 79% reduction in first infections after increased DA uptake and, and therapy. And the last issue I want to make, because I don't want to go over time, is one area of great interest because obviously with the opioid crisis and increasingly seeing women who are pregnant with hepatitis C, one of the issues is could we treat during pregnancy to prevent perinatal transmission? There is probably a presumed three to five percent risk of hepatitis C transmission uh, from the pregnant mother to her newborn. And in, in this first, very, very first pilot study, if you treat after gestation week 24 with sofalodiposphere in this case, which means that not every genotype was included into this study, all of these mothers became RNA negative and achieved cure, and none of the mothers passed on the infection to the children. There are always, always issues, but clearly uh, in this late stage of pregnancy, it seems to have no impact on the child, and I think we need more data to officially recommend that, but that may give some hope how we can prevent OMBR transmission uh, to newborns. So let me summarize. The risk for new hepatitis C outbreaks, particularly in IV drug use, remains and can become a huge challenge unless we continue to offer harm reduction methods, which have been shown to be successful. Um, we have to understand that chronic hepatitis C infection is established as soon as lack of spontaneous clearance can be predicted, so using the two log drop after four weeks rule, and hopefully getting a regulatory approval and a reimbursement of payers for earlier intervention to prevent onward transmission of hepatitis C. The data I showed you, at least successfully, alludes to a reduction in new incident cases of over 50% if that happens. Um, we clearly have to think about screening all PrEP users for hepatitis C on a regular basis as the overall prevalence is already between 4 and 8 percent in the various PrEP cohorts throughout the world, um, and obviously that is happening there as well. Uh, ChemSec 
Chemsex, which I haven't addressed so far, has further fueled the epidemic, and we need specifically targeted interventions uh, around chemsex, and I think that may be the best way forward to prevent chemsex-related transmissions. Uh, we need more data around hepatitis C treatment in pregnancy, and I think there still remains room for hepatitis C vaccine development. And so with that, I want to thank all the people who contributed data-wise and invite you all to the wonderful Basel conference, and you should know that the Canadian Association is also giving some free scholarships, so please apply. We'd love to see as many of you as possible in Basel, uh, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just wanted to point out that Dr. Rockstro is actually the president of the European AIDS Clinical Society and was in fact leading the meetings in Europe right up until coming here. There was really just one itinerary he could take to get here in time. So we really appreciate you making the special effort and thank you for your expertise.